managed to screw things up back in the 90 in the, in the, in the last Great Depression. Um, what's the likelihood of them being a savior for us this time? Uh, savior is zero, close to zero. Likelihood of throwing it up uh, close to 100. Um, it's never, you never, never want to say, you never want to say 100 percent. That's that's over the top. But yeah, the Fed. Uh, it's easy to say the Fed thing screwed up because they always do. So will they do it again? Yes. And I'll tell you exactly how. As of now, again, things can change. But as of now, the Fed is signaling as, as loudly as they can that they're going to start the taper in November. Uh, Jay Powell more or less said that at Jackson Hole. He said that in some congressional testimony. He gives himself an out, but they've and they believe in signaling. They it's not uh, you don't need a decoder ring to figure out what the Fed's going to do. They actually kind of tell you in, in you know, if not quite in so many words, it, it, you don't need an advanced degree to figure out what they're saying. So we're going to start the taper. Well, taper is a form of tightening. And a lot of people say, well, no, you know, because they're not raising rates yet. And they're still buying government securities. They're still printing money. They're just not printing as much as they did before. That's what tapering is. It's going to, they're going to reduce their asset purchases. Sorry. Everything happens at the margin. In a dynamic system, that's what capital markets are. The margin is what counts. And if you taper, you tighten. Now, I'm not saying they're going to go extreme. They'll probably do the taper, reduce purchases, $10, $12 billion a month for 10 straight months uh, you know, to get the $120 billion down to zero. Uh, and then it may take another year after that before they raise rates, although I personally don't think they'll get there. But um, but but that's that's their plan. Can we talk about uh, where where you see the biggest risk of the everything bubble bursting and potentially? I, I mean, I know it's a massive question. There's probably loads of at risk sectors. Is there one in particular that you think um, investors should be aware of? Uh, I would say I would say U.S. stocks. Now, now let me expand on that a little bit. Let me let me be very precise about what I'm going to say. Uh, people say you can't spot bubbles. You, bubbles happen, but you don't know until after the fact. You're better off cleaning up the mess than you are trying to pop the bubble and don't think you can know what a bubble is. That's completely wrong. Bubbles are easy to spot. You can see them a mile away. What you don't know is how long they're going to last and how high they can go. So just because you're in a bubble, uh, that doesn't mean go out and short the market or short the index. You can get crushed. I mean, I, to me, my, my metaphor is... Uh, you know, there's an 18 wheeler coming down the road at, uh, you know, 80 miles an hour and it's about to run off a cliff and you want to be the hero and you jump in front of the truck and say, hey, stop, stop. There's a cliff. Now, you're going to get yeah, yeah. You're going to get flattened. So I don't want to I don't want to short the U.S. stock market. I don't want to uh, stand in front of that 18 wheeler because it's a really good way to lose money. That doesn't mean it's not a bubble. What it means is that the bubble can go on longer than than you can stay solvent, as the old yeah. saying goes. So, uh, so I'm not saying go out and short it, but it's, it's clearly a bubble. And you can do that. You can ascertain that with a number of object, objective metrics. And um, there's a whole bunch of them. There's the, I, I like the Cape, uh, the Shiller Cape ratio, uh, what he does there. It's, it's a PE ratio. So no different than any other PE ratio, except he looks at 10 year trailing earnings. And the reason he does trailing earnings is let's let's forget the Wall Street hype about projections. Who knows, right? We'll do ten, we'll do trailing earnings, and let's do ten years because that will smooth out at least one or two business cycles. So uh, I was a, a banker way back when, and when I was first trained as a banker, they said uh, if you make a loan or approve a loan, uh, you need to make sure that that borrower can repay you through the entire business cycle. Meaning, if business turns down they had to still be strong enough to pay. Now that, that rule was thrown out the window along the way somewhere in the middle of my career uh, after I changed, uh, uh, moved over to investment banking because now they they think about the loan for 30 days, they securitize it, put it in a package, slice it, dice it and sell it to you or me uh, unbeknownst to everyone. And then they don't care because they're not around when the loan goes bad. But in the old days, you had to, uh, you had to think about the loan through the whole business cycle. So, but that's what the Schiller CAPE ratio does. It, um, uh, and by that measure, we are at the second highest valuation in history, higher than 1929, and second only to the dot-com bubble in 2000, which was about as extreme as, as it gets. Uh, so that's what that's. Uh, Warren Buffett likes a ratio where you look at stock market valuation relative to GDP. And the theory is, well, okay, what is the stock market? Well, it's earnings of a whole bunch of companies. Well, where do they get the earnings? Well, they get it from economic growth. Uh, yeah, some companies outperform others and some have technology and some don't. That's all true. But, but for the market as a whole, it's not uh, illogical to look at the economy as the thing that supports the market. 
Well, so if it, so right now the ratio of the stock market valuation to GDP is at an all time high. So, and, and there are other, as I said, there are other measures, there, there are quite a few of them. Uh, and they all say the same thing. We are at or near all time highs, depending on the particular metric. So the bubble part's easy. What's hard is timing. And again, I, I think my preference would be reduce your exposure to stocks, increase your cash holdings, move to the sidelines, wait till the fund's over, and then come in through the wreckage and buy some bargains. But uh, and, and that's another good way to make money. Um, and some, of course, most people say, well, I'll, I'll see it coming. I'll get it out the top. Okay, good luck. <laughs> most people don't. But, um, but, uh, but I'm not saying short it because the bubble can get worse before it pops. And, and in the meantime, buy some gold. When do bubbles pop? Uh, I don't want to put a stake in the ground and say bubbles going to pop next month. But oh no, um, no, of course. I, I, but 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 I would be careful in October. And let me explain why. We're coming up on a quarter end. September 30th is is a quarter end. Investment banks and commercial. I mean, there's not much difference between commercial banks and investment banks these days. But the banking industry as a whole does what they call window dressing, which is uh, for many purposes, you only report quarterly. You don't show a monthly balance sheet, you show a quarterly balance sheet. So you try to make a quarterly balance sheet look nice and pretty, you know, for, for outside investors, people don't know what's going on inside. That means reducing leverage, um, you know, unwinding repurchase agreements. I said, now that's all predictable and people know how to do it and they've been doing it, uh, you know, for forever, uh, for certainly for decades. But um, that seems to be happening at a time when there's a, shortage of high quality collateral and the highest quality collateral of course are treasury bills um they're they're 30 days 60 days 90 days uh they don't have coupons they trade a discount they're not very volatile you kind of what you see is what you get so you can buy a 10-year note or a five-year note but the treasury bills are the best form of collateral when the fed prints money which they've been doing by the trillions how do they do it they buy treasury bills and then they pay for them with money that comes out of thin air uh, that means the Fed has the treasury bills on their balance sheet. And the, and the treasury has been issuing fewer bills. They still have refunding operations going on, but issuing fewer bills. So there's this shortage of the very best quality collateral. And one of the ways you know that, you know, a doctor will say, uh, you know, if you don't hold a thermo thermometer up to the patient's head, you're not going to know if they have a fever, right? If you don't go looking for it. Um, look at a uh, treasury bill yields, which you know, just inverse the pricing, um, relative to the Fed's reverse repurchase facility. Now, the Fed's reverse repurchase facility is one where you can give the Fed cash and they'll buy you, they'll, they'll deliver treasury bills as collateral, so you get the treasury bills, but that can be unwound by the Fed, so you're not really sure how long you're going to have those bills, uh, and they pay you a certain interest rate. They pay you a fixed interest rate. Here's the point. Treasury bills are trading at a yield below what the Fed will pay you on a reverse of purchase agreement. So why would you do that? Why, why would you buy a treasury bill that is going to give you yield less than what you can get kind of for the asking from the Federal Reserve? Well, the answer is you need the bills. Mm. In other words, that inversion, that treasury bill yield below what the Fed will pay you for the asking tells you that there's a scarcity of bills. Now, if there's a scarcity of bills, which is good collateral, and we're coming up on a quarter end, and all this window dressing is going on and people can't get that collateral, they have to reduce their balance sheets. And that's gonna mean, that's gonna put stress throughout the system, the shadow banks and hedge funds and elsewhere. So, so let's see what happens. Uh, I'm not saying the end of the world comes on October 1st, but I am saying that combined with COVID, with um, the slowdown, with uh, weak employment numbers, with lower rates on bonds, uh, the inversion between treasury bills and um, what the Fed will pay you for the asking. Uh, these are all bad signs. They're all signs that there is a collateral shortage, a liquidity crisis pending, and it may be triggered at month end. So kind of pay attention to that.